I'm going to start a recording. <laughs> but we're just going to record this beginning part with some slides and some framing. Um, when we move into the larger discussion, we will stop the recording. I encourage folks to remind me to do that because I will inevitably forget. Um, and then we'll turn off the slides and we'll just be a conversation. Um, but we wanted to make sure we had some sort of some terms and some some framework to set out for the discussion. That said, if you came here to talk about something really specific related to ethics and edtech and you don't see it reflected in our opening slides, please don't think that that means you can't raise it. We're, we're very open to taking this in whatever direction is most useful to you folks as participants. Um, so we've called this ethical edtech, the questions we should ask and the answers we deserve. And really what we're gonna focus on here are like, what are what should you be thinking about when you procure use introduce to students new technologies um, when you use them in your own practice what are the kinds of questions that you should be asking and what should you expect when it comes to answers and um yeah that's sort of where where we're going and we'll introduce ourselves in in a second but i do want to open by saying that we're joining you today from tukamuk sequatmi territory it's where we are both uh, in what others know as beautiful Kamloops, British Columbia, um, the unceded traditional lands of Sequatmulu, where learning has taken place since time immemorial. And I'm not going to do a lengthy territorial acknowledgement today, but I do want to acknowledge that land acknowledgements are not really even a starting place. They're a token, they're a gesture that we extend, but when it comes to resolving the continuing trauma of colonialization, it begins with returning these lands. And so if you're not um, familiar with the Land Back movement, I strongly encourage you to check it out, landback.org. They also operate the Land Back University, which has some fantastic resources, for those of you who are in teaching positions that you can share with your students um, and also with your colleagues. So yeah, I hope you'll uh, take some time to, to check out those resources. Okay, I have all right, why not? Well, okay, there we go. Anne Marie, do you want to introduce yourself? I can do that for sure. So I'm Anne Marie Scott. I'm Deputy Provost at Athabasca University, which is based in Canada as well. As Brenna said, we're both here in the Kamloops to Sequepam, Kamloops, but I am I work remotely for an institution about 800 kilometers away from here. We're a fully online institution and we're an open access institution. So our learners are very often, um, many of them may not have finished high school, for example, coming back to education later in life, studying part time often, combining work with study, very often first generation um, learners. So a very, I don't know what non-traditional means within an institution where every learner is very different, but it does set a different bar and a different set of expectations. And I think that carries through to ethical consideration, some of our communities. I don't want to cast people as vulnerable, but could be more prone to exclusion or exploitation, perhaps. Um, we, unsurprisingly, a larger proportion of people who declare a disability come to my institution than many others, simply because remote is more accessible in, in many ways. Um, so, you know, the harms that can be done uh, can be much more impactful as well, just because of the makeup of our institution. I'm Deputy Provost there at Athabasca. Um, I joke that that means I do anything the Provost asks me to do. <laughs> That's what the Deputy piece means. But I look after um, all of our student services and our support services, so mental health and well-being, our office the registrar, various administrative pieces of the university, our accessibility services, um, but I have a long-standing history in educational technology and I lead quite a lot of projects in that space. Um, and you can tell from the accent, not Canadian, I was at the University of Edinburgh doing um, mostly ed tech work and IT work for many years before that. And I've had a long-standing interest in this ethical space. And it's a big part of why I made the move from an elite university to an open access university. I'll stop rambling there and Brenna, I'll let you say hello. <laughs> It was all good. It was not rambling. Uh, my name is Brenna Clark Gray, and I'm coordinator of educational technologies at Thompson Rivers University. Uh, much like Athabasca, TRU serves a very diverse student population. We're sort of uh, operate in two halves, which is uh, careful language, but we have a fully online division. Uh, 
T-R-U-O-L, Open Learning. And we also have a campus division, roughly similar student populations in terms of numbers, um, in terms of FTE equivalents anyway. Um, my background, I spent nine years as a community college English instructor, also serving primarily first-generation students at a commuter college in um, the Lower Mainland of British Columbia. And before that, I was a comic scholar. <laughs> and uh, so my, my background, I'm relatively new to the space of educational technologies, but my interest in ethics and educational technologies really comes from feeling um, like I spent nine years as an instructor with very little guidance. So um, I you know, was never informed, for example, about privacy um, requirements at all, what my obligations were, um, what the expectations were of the institution about how I handled data. When I was teaching at any of the institutions I taught at, you know, prior to being a full-time employee at, as a grad student at different institutions, never never trained, never taught, never came up in, in the guidance I was offered. And so when I moved into um, coordinating educational technologies, I really realized how little faculty are given in terms of resources, knowledge, and understanding about how to work ethically with technology. And so it's be, been a real passion focus of mine to help faculty understand the ramifications of the tools they choose. And recently, I should say, you know, Anne and I, we're friends, but we've also been working together. We've recently finished drafting a, a book chapter literally called Who Cares About Procurement? Because we do. Um, and thinking about, you know, where the conversation about ethics starts and who's involved in that conversation. And these are all issues that sort of, I've gone from being a frustrated instructional faculty member to, well, still a frustrated instructional support faculty member. I'm not sure that my level of frustration has changed, but I feel like I have more to say now, hence our session today. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that chapter later in the discussion portion. So can I ask Brenna, do you feel like your, your frustration is just more sharply defined now? Or? <laughs> I mean, you know is, I think about. there's something about knowing how much you didn't know that can really, um, it can either scare you off or it can really sharpen your focus. And for me, I think it's really sharpened my focus. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think my frustration is more specifically defined and, and directed. I'm, I'm less just annoyed at administrators, Anne Marie, and more with a sense of where my annoyance should be, should be pointed. So I think we'll, we'll talk a bit about that and a bit about roles and um, responsibilities within individual roles uh, today for sure. So before we came today, we kind of outlined some areas of ethical consideration. Um, and I think that, you know, this is non exhaustive for sure. And in many ways, I think it reflects the personal interests of both Anne Marie and myself. Um, but these are some areas that we think we should all be thinking about at all the different stages of engagement with technology. So we've noted here privacy and data storage, what data is collected, where is it stored, who has access to it, consent and transparency. Is that consent meaningful, free, and informed? My greatest frustration in the world is a click through, right? Like, just click through this screen and you can have access to the textbook you need to pass the course. Oh, well, that's ethical, free, informed consent for sure. Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, sort of pressing on you to make that choice. Um, monetization, a big question when we engage with educational technologies is like, where is the money being made and how? And this often connects back to issues of privacy and data. Um, bias and non-discrimination. So especially as we move into this more machine learning moment, let's call it hellscape, you might want to say, um, what assumptions does the machine make about our learners? What assumptions does it make about us? What assumptions does it make in general? Um, surveillance, obviously this has been a huge piece in the COVID um, landscape, the, the, I think, rise of awareness that people had about surveillance technologies has really increased and um, anxieties about them have rightfully increased as well. We've also seen how predatory surveillance companies are. Our colleague Ian Linkletter can, can uh, attest to how predatory and litigious some of these firms are. 
Something that working with Anne-Marie has made me way more aware of is thinking about environment and climate as ethical considerations. So what are the climate justice implications of this tool? Like, why do we get hives when we hear about somebody moving their credentialing system into the crypto space, for example? Um, and then labor, what labor is invisible or exploited as we move around um, technologies. And this can often include like gig work or outsourcing when we look at proctoring exam companies, for example, or transcription companies or whatever tool you're looking at, where is that labor happening and is it being um, ethically addressed, right? So as I said, non-exhaustive, but a place to start our conversation today, I'm hoping. Henry, do you want to add anything before I make you talk about areas of response? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, yes, I do. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think your, your, your last point there about transcription services is a really interesting one because as we'll go through this morning, we've got lots of we've got lots of opinions because we're ladies with lots of opinions. We have practices that have worked for us. We know about some good practices, but there are no easy answers. This is a massively contextual area, and it's also an area in which there's a lot of different factors to be weighed up against each other. Um, for example, transcription. Well, transcription can often be a support and a benefit for students with accessibility needs or colleagues with accessibility needs, um, and a, a big tool as far as inclusion is concerned. So that's one side of our ethical considerations, but when you're outsourcing that work to precarious offshore gig workers in order to meet that ethical obligation somewhere else, is that an ethical choice? Um, so there's some real tensions in this space and, and ultimately some trade-offs that have to be made as well. There's a, there's, and this is why I think in this whole area, I've really started to view it more generally through a lens of harm reduction. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that good is often achievable. So thinking about it through a harm reduction lens and doing as little harm as possible is often a more pragmatic um, a way of balancing all these different factors, because for sure there's a lot to be considered there. Um, and I, I did want to, to pick up, Christina um, put a comment in the chat about kind of environment and, and climate justice. Um, there are some excellent resources out there. I would definitely point people towards the work that people, Laura Chen, people like Laura Chenewich and um, uh, Kate Bowles do Australia, from Australia and South Africa respectively. And also Neil Selwyn in, in Australia, who many of you will know as, um, sorry, my cat is barfing on the floor. I'm very sorry if anybody hears any noises. <laughs> um, but who, who uh, has been a long-standing critic of ed tech and particularly in this ethics space and is really starting to look at climate justice as one of the big ethical issues. Um, so yes, when we think about some of the kind of futures of ed tech that are sold to us, particularly the kind of AI heavy automated ones. And we think about what they actually cost in power and, um, and compute time and so on. Um, and then we think about the extent to which much of the world has been on fire for the last year. The, this really has to be on our list of ethical concerns now. Um, and it might mean, this is, this is the tension in this space, it might mean less technology. So ed, you know, ethical ed tech might actually mean no ed tech sometimes, which is a really interesting thing to think about. But I'm sure we'll dig into a lot more of that and I could ramble for ages as people know. So let's think about some other <laughs> high level ways of framing responses. So we picked out four areas of, of response. There are others, these are broad categories. Brenna hinted at procurement earlier. It's an area that we've both been looking at, have our own experience and our, our own history with, bring our own questions to it. But fundamentally, this is the vehicle and the mechanism by which educational technology often gets into institutions um, because most of what comes into institutions these days tends to come from commercial suppliers, public sector organizations, use procurement processes. So, really looking at how those processes work, the extent to which ethical practices are embodied or embedded in them, 
And thinking about procurement more, more generally and holistically, there are examples of other kinds of procurement where ethical practices are embedded, often labor or supply chain kind of things, fair trade, that, that kind of thing. So why is that not finding its way into the technology space is a really interesting question. When you buy stuff, you have to implement it. So where does ethics fit in um, an, an implementation framework in an institution? How can, because you can buy something that's you know pretty okay and still make a terrible job of implementing it and, and supplying it to uh, colleagues and staff. So where does an ethical frame fit in that implementation space? What's the policy framework that sits around all of this? What policies might underpin a number of these activities? What, what policies might we need to protect ourselves sometimes? Often we think about data protection and ethical use of personal data in this space, but might there be other things? I mentioned a moment ago that quite often in institutions, there are policies in the procurement space about labor, modern slavery, that kind of thing. So are there things, are there other policies we don't have today that we need to develop in some of these, uh, well, I'm gonna call them adjacent spaces, but the point is they're not adjacent, they're actually very central to, to ed tech, but we don't think of them as our business often as ed tech practitioners. And then practice, how do we embody an ethical approach every day in our practice? Um, and there, are, there are, this is a, an area I think that's had a lot of um, attention in the last few years, lots of good practice out there and starting to see some tools and some frameworks for really guiding um, good practice at a high level. And we'll talk about one of those in a few moments as well. Something we've been talking a lot about is the way this practice question and the labor question maybe have a tendency to intersect. Oftentimes, there's the big ed tech that gets procured through the institution. And then there's the ads that come directly to faculty or staff, which are like, we know that your workload is unmanageable and your pay is not keeping up with inflation and you are stressed beyond means. Here's a technological solution that we're gonna offer to you, right? And so thinking about how to um, circumvent that, right, um, to, to ensure that ethics are a part of the questions that are being asked about those new tools, um, but also how the sort of larger, the choices that an institution makes around labor and um, precarity and all of those pieces can, can shape some pretty bad choices that get made. And I always think I think of homework systems when I think of this, textbook provided homework systems have been really created as a solution to uh, a problem of austerity, right? A problem of large class sizes, precarious instructors, lack of prep time. That's the, that's the solution um, that a textbook homework system is designed to solve. But that's a whole other bug there. <laughs> well, but you raise an interesting, uh, there's a bigger point in here. Uh, that we'll probably say that a few times over because our <laughs> pieces, but there's something in here quite fundamental and existential about um about that's a threat to higher education in, in mm -hmm. my view. And I've talked a little bit about this before in other places. You know, I, I carry the evil senior administrator title, so I, I care about things like quality assurance. Um, and some of the practices that come with these platforms have a governing effect on institutions. I could, I will not name them by name, but a textbook provider cut access with no notice to a textbook in a live course that we run. Mm -hmm. That affected our ability to teach a course. And mm -hmm. negotiating to get access to that textbook again, it's a, if, this is a global publisher. Our power in that relationship is very limited. Um, I think about, um, you, you mentioned proctoring solutions, I mentioned Neil Selwyn earlier, he's been pretty open that a paper he published last year, the year before, can't quite remember, was refused by or, or wasn't accepted by a, an ed tech journal because 
to talk about proctoring at that point in time was a pretty risky thing because you mentioned Ian Linkletter, a, a major proctoring company, were suing, are still suing an educational technologist for being critical of their project, product rather. Quality assurance in institutions is based on doing things and then evaluating them and closing that loop. If we are not able to evaluate our own practice and control our own practice, how can we make claims to have quality education, to deliver quality education? This, some of this stuff is really quite fundamental to our, our institutions if we're not able to openly and freely interrogate our practice. And as we'll probably go into um, in, in some of these conversations, that's interrogating how these systems work is not something that people often want us to do. It's very hard to get information about how a number of the, the tools and technologies that are in our institutions work. And so you have some direct experience with, with that. So I, I think there are some existential threats in here. It remains my big bugbear, particularly for those of us who work in public institutions, that this is that these tools are allowed to operate with such, you know, I don't know, there's some phrase for it that it's not coming to my mind right now, trade secrets or whatever, we don't get to know, but the money that's being spent on them is public money um, within public institutions and that I find really troubling. The other piece, you know, you were talking, Anne-Marie, about losing access to text. I think about this in this, um, the entrenchment of these technologies all the time when I think about University of Manitoba's strike back in the fall, which folks in Canada may remember, um, as a way of, uh, I guess, put, forcing the hand, um, the university made the choice to turn off access to the learning management system, which also meant because they are a campus that has an integrated textbook platform in the learning management system, it also meant that all the students lost access to their textbooks. So your instructors are on strike and you have been told by your university now that you can't even read ahead alone on your material while you wait for the strike to resolve. That's, I find that very terrifying <laughs> to me that that level of control could be exerted. And also that, that think about all the decisions up to that point that never imagined, you know, that the possibility of a labor dispute that never imagined the possibility of loss of access to the LMS, which could have happened, you know, from a, a ransomware attack or a million other things, right? And that there's no, um, there's no backup. There's no redundancy in the system for students to still be able to access their course materials that they have paid for, right? These, are, these haven't been like these aren't these aren't OER in this case. These are these are textbooks that students have paid for. Um, not that they shouldn't have access to OER, but they would have had access to OER, wouldn't they? All right. Um, one of the things that Anne Marie and I have been talking a lot about is that there's not a lot of options. Um, out there in terms of like, where do you start? We don't like checklists because checklists can feel like, oh, I ticked all the boxes and now I'm ethical, <laughs> done, which isn't really how ethics work because I'm sure everybody on this call knows. Um, but it can be helpful to have a framework, a place to start asking questions. And Amory, I wonder, because I can't navigate off my screen, if you could share the link to um, the framework in the chat. Um, this is the, the ALT framework of the Association for Learning Technology in the UK. And they frame sort of four areas, um, awareness, professionalism, care and community and values. And they're really, it's really not a checklist. It's like a series of open-ended questions in four areas to invite you to think. And you can use this, you know, if you are uh, a practitioner, you can use this just related to your relationship to a single technology in your classroom, but it can also be the start of some ethical questions around a larger procurement process. I think it's a useful framework as someone who supports faculty using technology. I think it's a useful place to start an ethical conversation on a campus where that might not be happening just yet. These are great questions to frame professional development work around comfort with technology. And yeah, Lawrence just points out in the chat, Everything in this image suggests an integration, right? That that none of these pieces work um, solo. That it, that the ethical landscape, as Anne Marie pointed out off the top, is always going to be a give and take. Always going to be about uh, seeking a least possible amount of harm kind of approach, and is also about the integration of different factors, different stakeholders, and different concerns. 
Anne Marie, did you want to say anything about the framework before we sort of open up the discussion? Um, I put the, the link in the chat um, there, as well as this graphic, if you explore some of the resources from um, the Association for Learning Technology. And for those of you who don't know who they are, they are um, they're a charity and they, I would describe them as my professional body, um, as a professional learning technologist. They, um, they are the UK based body who, who represent me and my community. And they have a strong focus on professionalization of practice more generally and have recognized ethical practice as one of those aspects of what it is to be a professional learning technologist. But if you explore that framework, you will find some information about how it came to be and who contributed to it. And you'll discover that it came out of a lot of community consultation. Um, but there's also a set of resources um, that underpinned it and informed it. And that's it's just quite a useful list to have. There's a, a lot of good um, underpinning resources, examples of policy from other places, for example. And as they go forward, this, this was launched only fairly recently, um, as they go forward, their plan is to collect up case studies that will help flesh this out a little bit. So uh, beyond it being a useful tool and a, a good place to, to uh, start and maybe a structure to frame some of the questions around it, I would kind of encourage people to just watch its development because I, I suspect that it will create more assets and, and useful information for us as a community. Um, and it, it is CC licensed as well, as you can see, so completely there for people to take and remix in your own context if there are variations on this that, that would be useful. But I think this is, um, there really aren't, for, for my money, there really aren't very, um, it's very hard <laughs> when you are trying to make decisions in an institution, often to put your hand to good information or good questions to ask in the moment. And, and my colleague and friend Amy Collier will describe this as a sort of vexatious gap in the information we have available to us. Um, so I think what I what I hope we can do today as we move forward with a bit of conversation is also share some practices and resources that have, have worked in the moment as well. When we're confronted by some of these ethical considerations, that's the benefit of having us all together in the room today. And we have good time for a conversation this morning because uh, we hinted at you know, the questions we should ask and the answers we deserve. Mm -hmm. well, we don't have them all. Um, we have we have our own. We know what has worked in our context. But as we said already, this is a highly contextual space. And Brenna, one thing we didn't note on the ethical issues piece, um, and it struck me just as you were doing the land acknowledgement, it's very specific maybe to, to certain territories, but thinking about where Indigenous education fits in an ethical framework, because that's another area of, of contention. Some of our practices, particularly around open education, Openness, yeah. can be really problematic um, in, yeah, in thinking about Indigenous knowledge. Um, this is definitely something we, we manage with greater or lesser success day to day at TRU because we have two missions. One is to be the open, to fulfill the open learning needs of the province. That's in the TRU Act. That's our responsibility as an institution. And also uh, our mission as an institution is to be the uh, institution of choice for indigenous learners in the province. And when we think about things like keeping knowledge in a good way, sharing knowledge in a good way, those, those questions are front and center, you know? And it's why I, I increasingly wanna have this conversation about um, open as in hearts, not necessarily open as in source, because some of the core principles of you know cc0 open are in conflict with some of the kinds of practices around sharing resources um, when it comes to indigenous knowledge but i don't think that open as a series of principles is necessarily in conflict if we if we if it doesn't have to be cc0 to be truly open right and i think you know, that's definitely another layer that we we need to keep having conversations about. Okay, so I am going to open up our discussion part now. And um, 
So a couple of things. These are our framing questions for today. Uh, what areas would you add or what other concerns about edtech ethics have we missed? What other areas of response should be considered? But most importantly, just a sec, Maha, as soon as I finish framing, I'll turn off the recording. Um, what questions, ideas, and scenarios do you have? And as we set off the top, we're going to stop the recording for this part of the session. We also, though, Emily and I are both really aware of the sensitivity around some of these questions and the anxiety that having these kinds of conversations can produce. So we do also have um, a Slido available for uh, anonymous questions if you wanna ask a question without connecting it to yourself even outside of the recording. So I'm gonna stop the recording, stop my screen share and find that link. Uh, and in the meantime, please do um, join, open, open, open invitation to join into the conversation. Okay.